Hello and welcome to the channel. As an educator, I really believe that taking the photo in the field is only half the work. The other half occurs when you get back to your office or to your home and get your images on your computer and that's where the, the second half of the equation comes into play. There are many choices when it comes to software to edit your images. A lot of photographers, myself included, gravitate towards Photoshop and Lightroom. And with good reason, they have been the industry standard now for decades. But that doesn't mean that it's the only option that you have. A few months ago, I was offered a copy of Luminar Neo to review and I took a look at it. I'll leave a link to the video up here. I suggest you take a look at it if you're not familiar with, with the program at all. But they just released a big update to it and added a lot of new features. And I thought it was time to take a look at this software again and review the new features and see how well they stack up. And before I get into it, I will say that this is a sponsored video and that Luminar and Skylum Software gave me a copy of this software, but they did not tell me what to say. And actually they are very welcoming when it comes to feedback. So I'm definitely not gonna gloss over any of the shortcomings or heat praise where none is needed. But if there's something good about it, which there is, I'm gonna definitely share it with you. So if you're ready, let's get started. We're gonna take a look at this photograph of the Golden Gate Bridge that I took several years ago. One thing that you'll notice that I find kind of odd is that the generative tools are clumped here on the catalog page instead of under the edit page. And I think that's because the generative tools that they have here have to reach out to the internet. So it's, it's not lumped in under the edits for some reason, because it will ask you once you finish with this, any of these generative tools, if you want to save your image and then it will save it, then you can go in and edit it. So I recommend that you use any of the generative tools first. So with this image, we're going to go to generate. We'll click that right there. And you'll notice there's this boat. This is pretty long exposure, several seconds. I don't remember how long it was off the top of my head, but um, the tools are really straightforward. We got generate. We can zoom in a little bit here to like 50% to be able to see it a little bit better. This boat that's all blurred over here. We can uh, increase the size of our brush. I like the way that it shows your brush size as you move this along. And then once we've got a decent size, we're just going to paint over our boat and then we're just going to say erase. So it's going to do its magic. It's going to upload something to the cloud or hit some servers or I have no idea what magic it does, but it's going to think about it. And then there it is. It's all done. <clears throat> and if I like the look of it, I can just deselect here so I can see it. And that looks absolutely fine to me. It's all gone. And if I want to, I'll just say save. And then it will save it back into my catalog. So we're going to go into edit now. And I'm going to show you some of the new features that I really, really like. The first thing we always hit is this enhance AI because it just does a really nice guy, a really nice job right off the bat. So we're going to hit accent AI and we're going to bring this over and see what it does. And it's doing some nice contrast to it. It's, it's bringing a little bit more color into the image. And then if I want to enhance the sky, I want to hit that as well. Let's bring that in. It's, see, it's darkening the top of that sky, giving it just a little bit more color there. I really like the way that those, those look. Maybe back it off just a little bit. Less is usually more when it comes to these edits. The next thing we want to look at is real quick. We're going to go all the way down here to Twilight Enhancer. And this one is really cool. So you can choose the type of twilight that you want to adjust. There's a mauve, there's a golden, there's a blush, there's an emerald and a blue. Because of the colors of the Golden Gate Bridge, we can try golden first. And uh, it's already set to 70, which is a lot. We can bump this exposure back um, and let's see. And I'm not liking the colors so much on that. So let's go back to mauve that looks a lot better. This is looking pretty good. So what we're going to do is we're going to bump the exposure up so that it's not so dark. And as we bring this in, notice what it's doing to the water. It's doing a nice, it's adding some nice uh, color grading to the water reflection of, of this, of these colors in it. You know, it's, you know, that's obviously way too far, but somewhere around in there looks 
pretty nice. If I want to see what it looks like before, I just click this eyeball, before, after, before, after. And I really like what it's doing to these lighter areas of the sky right here. Again, before, after, before, after. It's really warming this water up quite a bit. Maybe um, we're going to just, just tweak this a little bit, maybe bring it back just a little bit and make it a little bit just the smallest amount brighter. So we're good to go there. The next thing we'll take a quick look at is uh, we'll go to this water enhancer. And again, to turn it on, you have to, you know, kind of crank this slider, which is going to give you your amount. Then you've got blue, green, original color, brightness, and contrast. And you can put a lot more blue in. You can pull some blue out. You can put some green in. And in this case, we're probably just going to keep it simple and have a little bit of blue and the amount can go to an extreme of a lot but let's just put just a little bit of blue back in there like that i don't want any green and we can also bring that original color back if i want more of that mauve and this stuff in there i'm going to do that notice that it already made a nice mask of my water automatically in this water enhancer. I didn't even have to choose mask, it automatically did it. And that's pretty, pretty nice. You can also adjust the uh, mask area down here with a brush, but I think it came out just fine. The next thing we're gonna take a quick look at is the HDR merge. I do real estate photography uh, in addition to my landscape workshops and teaching. And one of the things that I do is I bracket my photos, especially when I'm doing interior images. When you have to shoot over a whole house and you end up with hundreds and hundreds of photographs from that, that house and you're having to manually put the HDR brackets together, it can take some time. But with Luminar Neo, I can do it very, very quickly with a minimum of interaction for me. I'm not gonna do all of them. I'm gonna just pick some of these. Once I've got my images selected, I'm just going to drag these over to HDR Merge and drop them in there. It's going to uh, tell me I'm, I'm ready to merge and I'm gonna do batch HDR. So that will let it know that it's not uh, one image, it's actually several uh, or hundreds for that matter. And you click these little dots here, it's gonna allow you to open up some settings. We're gonna do auto alignment, always a good idea, even if you're using a tripod. I'm gonna do chromatic aberration reduction. I'm not gonna worry about ghost reduction. There's nothing moving in, in any of my shots, so that is not a big deal. So once I've got those set, I'll just click that again, and I'm ready to merge. So I'm gonna click Merge. And it's gonna give me the option to go through here, and if there's any that, uh, that are out of whack or I don't wanna include in that, uh, in that bracket, I can adjust. Um, and it's actually pulling in some of my stuff that's already been done. So like this is not a bracket. It realizes it's, it's, a, it's a TIFF that's already been created. So here we go. These are all DNGs. These are all my digital negatives. Let's see here, what do we got? And, and that is correct. So it allows you to preview, go through, and make any corrections that you might need, to, that the software might have made a mistake with. And usually it's spot on. It's absolutely spot on. So once I'm happy with the way that these look, I say continue, and it's gonna merge three photographs. And we'll speed this up, and when it gets done, I'll show you what they look like. So it didn't take too long. And again, while it was processing, I could be off doing other work or just taking a nap. It doesn't even matter. Sometimes I'll just let it run and go to bed. Next morning, all my photos are done. It doesn't matter how long it takes. But it didn't take that long. And when I get done, I can just go in and just put some real basic edits on these and deliver them to my client. The next thing we're going to take a quick look at is the panorama stitching. And this is the best stitching that I've seen. It's much better than Lightroom. It's better than what Photoshop does. It does an absolutely fantastic job. So when you want incredible control over your stitching for any kind of a panorama, this is what you're gonna to wanna to do. So we're gonna go in, this is from uh, Japan. And it's super easy, just like we do an HDR merge. What we're gonna do is we're gonna click one, two, three, four, five. There was, this is a six image pano. And then I'm gonna just click and drag it down here to the panorama stitching. Drop it off. And then I'm gonna open these little dialog dots here and give me my options. And I'm gonna say, do any distortion correction. 
Um, I don't really care about vignetting, but I absolutely do want the chromatic aberration reduction on. And then once that's done, I'm going to just say start, and it's going to load and prepare the images. So here is our panel. It gives you multiple options as far as the way that it's uh, the, the way that it's created. There is spherical, there is cylindrical, and you can watch how this changes a little bit as I pick it. Um, there's Mercator. I have no idea. I've never heard of that one. Um, then there is Plain. And then there is fisheye. And you can see how it's kind of distorting and, you know, projecting that image based on the model that I tell it to do. I think that the plane looks pretty good. But check this out. I can click and drag and I can move this around and to put that distortion or that you know, where, how I want it to end up in the frame, which is really cool, especially when you pick, like if you pick the spherical, give it a second, and then you can move it around. And so if you ever have an, uh, a pano that you want to kind of stretch the top of it, maybe it's the Milky Way or maybe it's a mountaintop, the ability to take this and kind of move it around before you lock it in is super, super useful. But I'm gonna go back here to uh, the plane and you'll notice again that it's kind of cutting off the top of my uh, spire there. So I'm gonna move this down just the smallest amount and over just a little bit like that. Kind of like that, I'm gonna say continue. And then it's gonna give me the option to crop. So we'll say crop and then we'll say save. Another thing that I really like about Luminar is that it'll put your panos in a folder called Panorama Stitching, so they're all in one place. And with Lightroom, it's, it's a struggle to find your panos. You either have to type in a keyword, pano, you can look for them, but there is, it doesn't do a good job of identifying those finished stitched images. And with Luminar, it actually puts it into a folder called Panorama Stitching, and here's our image. Let's take a quick edit and look at it. I mean, this is a, a well over a 100 megapixel file because it's a pano that I, I did vertically with my A7R5. And it actually looks amazing. It came out great. I have absolutely no issues with the way that the pano stitched. The next thing we're gonna take a look at is focus stacking. And focus stacking is where you take a series of images with a different focus point that's moving from close to the camera to infinity so that you can get everything sharp. In this case, I'm out in the gorge and we're gonna take a look at, I did nine shots in order to get the depth of field that was necessary to make the image. So again, it's gonna work very similar to what we've already done. I'm gonna select the nine images Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, here we go. Then I'm gonna drag them over here to focus stacking, click the little dots. Auto alignment is super important. It gives you the option for a reference image and it kind of picks the one in the middle. And that's simply because if you've got something that's moving such as the sun or the moon, it should, use using the one in the middle, is gonna cause everything else to move the least, if that makes sense, when it tries to align everything. So we're going to leave it right there where it is. That's absolutely fine. We're going to keep that chromatic aberration reduction on. And then what we'll do is we're just going to say stack. And then it's going to do its thing. You'll notice the little bar here, the little uh, busy signal is going. We'll speed this up. And when it gets done, we'll take a look at the uh, image. It's all done with the focus stacking. Let's see how well it did. Here's our image. And notice again, it put it in a folder called Focus Stacking. I like that. Uh, let's go to Edit, and we'll take a look at the image. Oh, uh, not good. So I'm going to zoom in here. And you can see that it didn't align the stuff well at all. Um, it's, yeah. This is OK right there. But um, yeah, it did. It did not. It did not do a good job on on this. And um, I don't know if 
if I think it's the the stacking algorithm is not working as well in Photoshop when I've done these done these exact images it came out absolutely flawless if you ever notice that your camera if when you move the focus point it call it's called focus breathing you'll see it kind of like move in and out it's not zooming or unzooming it's not changing your focal length it just it breathes just the smallest amount and that's something that all cameras do for some reason it doesn't seem like luminar does a good job of accounting for that and also there was a little bit of wind this morning that i took these photos and with flowers and stuff and being outdoors you cannot possibly hope to have everything to remain absolutely stationary again photoshop seemed to be able to account for this really really well whereas luminar had massive issues with it so for a quick recap generace it works fine takes a little bit of time but it does work and without any issues the hdr merge the batch processing that they have added is excellent it really helps my workflow out it may not help you it might be something you don't need but having that hdr merge batch processing is huge for saving me time the focus stacking i think it definitely needs work i was unable to get a clean focus stack and I'm never going to be shooting things that are absolutely 100% static. Um, and so if, if it can't account for focus breathing or minute variations between the images to adjust them, then it's, it's, going to be a, it's, it's not going to be a useful feature for me at this time when Photoshop does such a much better job. Uh, panorama stitching, super big win, works great. A lot of features that um, Lightroom doesn't offer, Photoshop doesn't really offer, and the ability to move your pano around after it's stitched to get the right, um, the right framing for it, where you can move that distortion from the panoramic image, you can and adjust it with all those different models, is absolutely fantastic. I really, really, really like that. As far as the editing features in here, um, I definitely like the Twilight Enhancer. I think that's a big win. It's super cool. The Water Enhancer, it's, it's okay. It does help bring out some different colors in the water and it does the masking for you. So that's very, very nice as well. Luminar Neo continues to improve and get better with every single release. I, for one, am going to stick with it and see what they can come up with next. If you'd like to download your own trial or your own copy of the software, there's a link in the description below. And yes, it is an affiliate link and it does help provide support the channel. Don't forget to check out my upcoming workshops at www.jamesparkerphoto.com. You can drop me an email if you'd like more information. You can also sign up for my newsletter there, which goes out about every month, every six weeks, and it gives you an update on things that I'm doing, places I'm going, and new workshops as they are announced so you don't miss out. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.